to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ thanks be to god who gives us the victory through our lord jesus christ we welcome you today to our study of the book of 1 Corinthians. Today we're going to be studying 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the closing words of Paul in chapter 16 as well. And we want to encourage you to locate your Bible and have it ready to use as we're going to look to the Word of God for all of our study today. Friend, we're so glad that you joined us and we hope to encourage you to visit the Church of Christ in your area as well. You'll find people at the Church of Christ who love the Lord, who are concerned about the lost, and who simply want to do what the Bible says. You'd be happy to, they'd be happy to have you at any of their assemblies, whether it be Sunday or Wednesday. You'd be an honored guest. And friend, we want to encourage you also in your study of the Word of God uh, if you, to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have all our information available on our website free of charge. We've got transcripts, study questions, audio lessons, video lessons, and just a host of good Bible study material available to you. It's all free of charge. If you'd like to have a copy of this lesson or any of our previous lessons on any book of the Old or New Testament or a wide variety of topics, we make those available to you free of charge. We'll send you a CD or a DVD. We'll even pay the postage to get it there, or you can download it from our website as well by filling out a free media request form. And friend, we want you to know that our motive in bringing these lessons is because we want men and women to know God, to know His Word, and to go to heaven. Let's study our Bible together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 16, Paul is now going to discuss two major ideas. In chapter 15, the heart and core of what he's going to say uh, deals with the resurrection. Some were denying that, and he's dealing with this problem by showing the importance of the resurrection. And then in chapter 16, he will talk about giving as a Christian and some concluding thoughts that occur there, there as well. Now, why is the resurrection such an important doctrine and teaching to Christianity? And friend, it's so important because the heart and core of the gospel is tied into the resurrection. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 3. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed it in vain. Now notice, for I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. We've often heard and said that part of the core of the gospel message is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And friend, if you leave off the resurrection, you've left off all the hope. Uh, let me explain that. The death of Jesus is so powerful, powerful, don't get me wrong. Without the shedding of blood, no forgiveness of sins. Jesus' death was the ultimate uh, way of opening that door of salvation. He, through death, overcame Him who had the power of death. Hebrews 2.13, the burial of Jesus uh, showed that He would go into the grave, and just like every other per human, He faced death. But what if the story, what if the message of the gospel ended there? Here's the message of the gospel like that. Jesus died, Jesus buried. Okay, so what? Where's the hope? Without the resurrection, that message ends too shortly and without hope. Jesus not only died, Jesus was not only buried in the grave like every other person who's died, but Jesus came up out of the grave and He overcame death, He overcame sin, He overcame Satan, and His resurrection is proof positive that there's more to life than just living and dying, that we can live again. 
Jesus said this in John 11, 24 and 25. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never really die. Friend, the promise of eternal life is uniquely tied. Your hope of heaven, the promise of eternal life, living with God forever. If there's no resurrection, then friend, all of that is basically worthless. In fact, Paul will say that. He'll say, if there's no resurrection, uh, our preaching is worthless, our faith is empty, we are liars and false witnesses, uh, you're still in sin because the gospel is not true because the Bible said he was resurrected, our only hope is in this life, and of all people, we're the most pitiable because we say, Jesus died, He was buried, and He resurrected, and you need to live in such a way that you can be resurrected, and if you've lived that way and there's no resurrection, ha-ha, the joke's on you. Well, that's the most pity of all people, right? And so the resurrection is so integrally tied, integrally tied to everything about Christianity, and that's why Paul wants these Christians to see there is a resurrection. Now, let's think about that idea. What's, if the resurrection is true, how can we know if the resurrection is true? Well, here's the proof of that. Look in 1 Corinthians 15, and the resurrection was not something that just happened in secret in some dark corner there. The resurrection is provable by all the people who saw it, many of those who were, didn't even believe in Jesus, and by the Word of God. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5. The Bible says that he was seen by Cephas, there's one person, Peter. He was seen by the twelve, there's a group of other, number six. After this, he was seen by 500 people at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due season. And so you've got a multitude of people who saw the Lord after his resurrection. You've got the... Uh, You've got the, 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 the soldiers who went back to the tomb. He's not here. He's risen. Uh, you, you've got uh, people trying to cover that up in the Bible. There's just too much <clears throat> eyewitness evidence. And then, of course, the evidence, of course, is the Word of God. How can I know the resurrection's true? Not just by the eyewitness firsthand evidence. But friend, if I can prove the Bible is the Word of God, and you can prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt, we've got lessons addressing that as well, and there's a whole lot of evidence on that. But if you can prove the Bible is the Word of God, then friend, you can rest assured the resurrection is true. And so that being the case, what will happen at the resurrection? Well, friend, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that at the resurrection, Christ will deliver the saved to God. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 24. The Bible says, then comes the end, when He delivers the kingdom of God to the Father, when He puts an end to all rule, all authority, and all power. At the resurrection, God is going to collect from His kingdom all the saved, Christ is, and those people are going to be hand-delivered to the Father. What a wonderful picture that is. But you know, there's something else so powerful that happens at the resurrection. At the resurrection... The last enemy, death, is going to be defeated. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 25 and 26. The Bible says, For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. What's great about the Lord defeating death at the resurrection? I don't have to worry about death anymore. All of us are cognizant of that fact. After this life, no more. Revelation 14, and being a Christian, you don't have to worry about death either. Revelation 14 verse 13 puts a, a different slant on it for Christians. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Psalm 116 verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. He, Jesus, through death, overcame them, him who had the power of death and has released those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. Bondage by what? Death. Jesus defeated that. And thus, Jesus would say, all who are in the grave will one day come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And so we don't live in fear of death because of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friend, as we think about that idea, there's a lot of questions concerning the resurrection that relate to the final day. 
what's going to happen when the Lord comes uh, on that resurrection day, when, it, when the final curtain falls and everything ends? What's that day going to be like? Now, no doubt, nobody knows the timing of that. From Matthew 24, verses 34 through 36, Jesus said, no one knows the hour. Uh, no one knows the hour of the time but the Father Himself. And so God's not told us when that's going to be, but we know what it's going to be like when it happens. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. The Bible says this, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O, o Hades, where is your victory? Look at all the things that are going to happen. It's going to be quick. It's going to be sudden at the coming of the Lord. We'll not all sleep. That means people will be alive when it happens and they'll be changed. The corruptible um, mortal body will take on corruption and immortality. That is, will not die anymore. And how wonderful a day that'll be. And ultimately, death, sin, Hades, hell, Satan himself will be defeated. The greatest enemy of all will be destroyed. And friend, it's on that day that the ultimate victory will occur for every child of God. What a great victory. Every child of God will, will realize on the resurrection day, ultimately and finally. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. I love these words in verse number 57. The Bible says it this way, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Specifically, victory over death, victory over sin, victory over the Hadean realm, the realm of the dead, and no doubt victory over the devil. What a Christians, you know, here's what's great about being a Christian. You're on the winning side. You're already on the side that's going to be victorious. Our aim then needs to be to stay faithful. You see, the Bible says in 1 John 4 verse 4, he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 4, this is the victory we have, even our faith. To the child of God who, who is living for God, he has more power through God. His faith is going to give him the victory, and ultimately, through the Lord, he's going to be victorious. Now, having said all of that about the resurrection, about our victory, about the one who's in us is greater than the one that's in the world, friend, there is a part we have something we've got to do as well in this race. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. The Bible says this, in view of all that, Paul says, therefore, since these things are true, you're going to have the victory. My beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Friend, our part is to remain steadfast. I'm to be steadfast. I'm to be immovable. Don't let your faith be shaken. Don't listen to the winds of change. Don't listen to the problems that may be coming in from the world. Be steadfast, immovable. Always be abounding in the work of the Lord. Continue to work faithfully for the cause of God. For if we do that, we know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. What, what does the resurrection do for us? Friend, it encourages us. It encourages me, and it ought to encourage every Christian since Christ was raised from the dead. And since the Bible teaches that if I remain faithful unto death, one day I'll be raised to the, I will receive the resurrection of life. Friend, that encourages me to keep pressing on. Don't give up. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how difficult the temptation, no matter what you've got to face, there is a resurrection to life coming, eternal life. That can be yours and that can be mine. Therefore, be faithful unto death. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 10. Nothing externally in this life can take that away from you. 
The Bible says in Romans 8 verse 31, neither height nor depth nor, nor any other external thing can separate us from the love and no doubt the promises of God. Therefore, we consider the sufferings of this present time not even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Romans chapter 8 verse number 18. Now Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the concluding chapter, We'll talk a little bit about the Christians making sure that they have a, a life that is giving and good, making sure that they're living according to the teaching of God. And he kind of lays out some concluding thoughts as well in this chapter. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2, Paul discusses the idea of giving. And, and please understand this as we mention this, friend. We're not talking about giving to the program today. That's not, not the idea. Giving, as discussed in the Bible, is something the Christian does in the local congregation as part of worship on the first day of the week. That's what we're talking about in the Bible. Look at 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week, and in the New American Standard, English Standard, and a Greek, Nestle Allen, UBS text, the word every is there. On the first day of every week, kata, every week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. They were taking up for the needy saints who had been affected by either persecution or calamity. And Paul gave orders to the churches of Galatia and the churches here that on the first day of every week, they were to lay by as they'd prospered so that there'd be no collections when he came. Now notice some things about this. Giving was a command. As I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. God wants us to follow his commands. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. There were some specifics about this. It was on the first day of the week, that being when Christians gathered together to worship. Acts chapter 20, verse 7, and as we mentioned, uh, apart from the majority text, the UBS and the Nestle Allen text teaches us, or we see from that, that the word every is there on the first day of every week. And so Christians were coming together on the first day of every week to partake the Lord's Supper, and they also gave of their means at that time. According to 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, uh, we give as we've been prospered. We don't give grudgingly or out of necessity. I don't give because if I don't, I'm going to go to hell. I give as I prosper and I give cheerfully to the Lord. That's my motivation and the, the, the reason that I want to give is because God has given so much to me. Think about these words. James chapter 1 verse 17 says this, Every good and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, of whom there is no shadow or variation of turning. God's given so much, how would we not want to give back in the local congregation to the work of the church. Now, there's another item that we want to mention as well, and that is we give as we prospered. Friend, I can't give more than I, I, I have or as I prospered. I've got, I'm, there, there are various commands in the Bible that go along with this as well. I'm commanded to take care of my family. I'm commanded to uh, provide the necessities. God will help me, but I'm commanded to work and provide the necessities of life. No doubt I would have to provide for health and food and shelter and clothing and, and things like that. A certain amount of recreation would no doubt be needed as well. But where in that is our giving? As we've prospered. As God has taken care of us above and beyond, we ought to factor God first into that and do what we can to give to His cause and to His kingdom in so many ways. And so that, of course, would be to reach the lost and to do good in our communities. Now, from 1 Corinthians 16, Paul also teaches us uh, something that we've got to be on the lookout for and even against in every area of life. Look at 1 Corinthians 16, verse number 13. Paul says these concluding thoughts. He says to the church there, I want you to watch. I want you to stand fast. I want you to uh, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. Christians must stand fast in the faith and do what God wants them to, to be right in God's sight and to give honor and glory to Him in each and every way. But part of that is standing strong. 
Part of that is being faithful. Part of that is uh, letting all that we do be done out of love for God and for His cause in every way. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not vain in the Lord. We've got, Christians have got to stand firm in the faith. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to him must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How do we get faith? Friend, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 uh, teaches us, and, and the Lord wants that when He comes back. Luke 18, 8, Jesus asked, When the Son of Man comes, will He find faith? Well, if we're living true to God's Word, He will indeed find faith. And so we've got to stand firm in the faith. We've got to be brave. The word be, be brave, the literal wording is, now, I believe the King James will say, quit ye like men. The literal wording is, act like men. Be brave. It's a phrase that's used to describe bravery and courage. Not only do we need to live with, with faith and be strong, stand strong, but we need to be brave in what we do. Joshua chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, Joshua, God would say to Joshua, don't turn to the right hand or the left, but be brave, be courageous, be strong, uh, basically, be a man is what the Lord is saying here and stand up and do what's right. And then, of course, in 1 Corinthians 16, that final statement in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, the idea is, let all that you do be done with love. Love ought to be the motivating factor in all that we say and do. You see, the Bible teaches in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, the Scripture says, Preach the truth in love. What's our motivation? John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. The Bible says, Let brotherly love continue. And in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1, the Bible says, Knowledge puffs up but love edifies. And so as we think about this message, as we think about the concluding ideas in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, as, as Paul has had to say some rather difficult things, Paul wants them to know what I've done and said has been out of love. Listen to the final words of 1 Corinthians 16, verses 19 through 23. Paul says, The churches of Asia greet you, Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. This salutation with my own hand, Paul's. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O Lord, come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. You can hear the, the tenderness which Paul addresses this. But remember, Paul had to say some things like, put that ungodly man out from among you. Paul had to say some things like, you're acting like babies in the church. Paul had to say, stop abusing the Lord's Supper. Paul had to say things that were very difficult and challenging. But Paul said those things with a motivation of love. And friend, that's our motivation today. We want you to know that God loves you deeply. God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That includes you and that includes me. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. The Bible says, The Lord's not slow concerning His promises, as some men count slowness, but He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The God of heaven, more than anything in the world, wants us to be saved. And friend, we also love you, and we want you to be saved. If you've never become a Christian, why not do that today? The Bible teaches in Acts 4, verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father 
except by Him. And He's promised us that if we'll obey the gospel, one day we can live with Him forever in heaven. Now maybe you're thinking, what do I need to do to become a Christian? How does one obey the gospel? Well, friend, obeying the gospel is simply submitting to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And we do that as is taught in the Bible. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Once we've believed in Jesus, we die to sin just as Jesus literally died. That is, we repent and turn from sin. Having believed in Christ, I'm willing to repent of sin. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. The Bible teaches, once I've repented of sin, I must confess my faith in the Lord. Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33. And like Jesus was buried, I must be buried in water in baptism. The Scripture teaches that baptism, no doubt, is essential to salvation. I want you to listen to two passages today. Acts 22, verse 16, when Ananias came to Saul, here's what he said. Saul, Saul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And then, uh, not only was Paul told that his sins would be washed away at the point of baptism, but Peter said it this way. In 1 Peter 3, verse 21, Peter said, There is also a like figure which does now also save us. Baptism. Baptism does now also save us. Friend, baptism is essential in God's plan of salvation, but just like Jesus, we must rise out of the watery grave of baptism and walk in newness of life. Romans 6 verse 4, we must be faithful unto death and live every day in such a way that God is honored by our life. And so if you're not a Christian, we want to encourage you to obey the gospel. If as a Christian, friend, uh, our encouragement to every person who's striving to be a Christian, live right, is this. Live every day in view of the resurrection. There's something better coming. There's something that is so much better that's worth looking forward to, and it will be worth it if we hang in there. In the words of Jesus to his seven congregations in Revelation 2, we pray that you will be faithful unto death and join us next time as we study together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.